and the companion of Juraj. قال كان جريج رجل عابد لله سبحانه وتعالى فاتخذ صمعته فجاءته أمه فنادته فقالت يا جريج وكان جريج في الصلاة فقال يا ربي أمي والصلاة فاستمر في الصلاة فذهبت أمه فجاءته أمه في اليوم الثاني فنادته وهو في الصلاة فقالت يا جريج فقال جريج يا ربي أمي والصلاة فاستمر في الصلاة فجاءته أمه في يوم الثالث فنادته فقالت يا جريج فقال يا ربي أمي والصلاة فقالت أمه فدعا فدعت عليه فقال اللهم لا تمته حتى ينظر في وجوه المومسات <coughs> The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said none spoke in the cradle except three Jesus the son of Maryam and the companion of Juraj and he didn't mention the third one until the end of the hadith and he goes into the story of Juraj Juraj was a man from Bani Israel who was a worshiper, devout worshiper to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And pay close attention to this because it shows how the devout worshiper, uh, contrary to the scholar or the person of religious knowledge, how he can fall into error because of his religiosity. A lot of times when people are religious, religious people who have no knowledge, they become amazed with themselves and be and put themselves in a situation where they fall into error on many occasions similar to the individual in the hadith of the man who killed 99 people the first person that he went to was a rahib was a worshiper similar to juraj and he said to the worshiper i killed 99 people in toba can i repent and what did the worshiper say to him he said you killed 99 people ain't that like a toba how can you possibly repent and so the man killed him, completing a hundred. But when he went to the scholar, he went to the knowledgeable person, Adam, and he said, I killed a hundred people. When he went to the scholar and he said, I killed ninety I killed a hundred people, can I repent? And the scholar said to him, not based upon his own desires, not based upon his own sympathies. He said, what can come in between you and your repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Nothing. And that is the difference between someone who responds with knowledge and someone who responds, who's religious, but responds based upon his own, you know, vision of what it means to be religious. So Juraj <coughs> was a religious man, and he took his monastery, his soma, his place of worship, and he remained in there for many days. And his mother came to the monastery and called him from the outside. Ya Juraj. While Juraj was in prayer. Juraj conflicted not knowing should I respond to my mother, break my prayer, respond to my mother, or should I continue in my prayer? Here again, caught in between the two. So what does he do? He ignores his mother and he continues in his prayer. He said, oh, oh, oh Allah, should I respond to my mother or should I continue praying? And he continued praying. And his mother left. His mother came back a second day, called him from the window. Yeah, Juraj. While he was in prayer, Juraj conflicted, said, Oh Allah, should I respond to my mother or should I continue praying? And he continued praying. The mother came back for the third day, called him, Yeah, Juraj. Juraj said, should I, should I respond to my mother or should I continue praying? He continued praying and his mother made a dua against him. His mother said, Oh Allah, <clears throat> Allahumma. لا تمته حتى ينظر في وجوه المومسات. Oh Allah, do not allow my son to die until at first he looks into the faces of prostitutes. The scholars who explained this hadith said that it was incumbent upon Juraj to break his prayer and to respond to his mother. This is the haq, the right that your mother has over you. In Islam, if you are praying a sunnah prayer, <coughs> You're praying a voluntary prayer, a supererogatory prayer, and your mother calls you, 
It is your mother's right for you to break your prayer and go and respond to your mother. The only time you do not respond to your mother is if you are praying an obligatory prayer, Salat al-Fariba. You're praying an obligatory prayer because in that case, the right of Allah takes precedence over the right of anyone else. However, if you are praying a Sunnah prayer, then the right of your mother takes the right over your Sunnah prayer. Because in Islam, we don't give precedent, precedence to something that is Sunnah over something that is Wajib. And in this situation, the responding to your mother is Wajib and your prayer is Sunnah. So you give precedence to what is Wajib. It's similar to the right of the husband over the wife. If the wife is fasting, a supererogatory fast, and the husband wants to be intimate with his wife, his haq is wajib. Fasting, supererogatory fast, Monday, Thursday, three days out of the month, it is sunnah. And you do not give precedence to something that is sunnah over something that is wajib. She is to break her fast and to satisfy her husband. So you, ha you have certain human rights that take precedence even over some of the supererogatory acts of worship. SubhanAllah. And it shows you the, 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 the magnificence of Islam in giving the human being certain rights, even over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a situation where it is not, uh, uh, it is not watching. So Juraichi ignored his mother three days in a row. And the mother got so upset and so angry, she supplicated against him. And this is something for us as parents to be aware of. And that is not to get so angry at your children that you make dua against them. She said, oh Allah, do not allow him to die until he looks into the faces of prostitutes. And for someone who is religious, this is obviously something that is an atrocity to stare and to look into the face of a prostitute. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَالْكَرَّهَا إِلَيْكُمْ وَالْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْإِسْيَانِ That he has made detestable, hated to you, kufr, disbelief, fusuq, criminal acts, وَالْإِسْيَانِ And any act of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is hated to the believer. So think about today how believers stare into the faces of women, stare into the faces of women today who resemble prostitutes, who resemble prostitutes on the TV screen, on the movie screen, Muslims who, you know, engage in certain behaviors that they should not engage in. And, and with no problem, sometimes with the family, sometimes with husband and wife. You have, you know, Muslims who look at, you know, these, you know, pro-fighting you know, when the guy has no shirt on, he has on sh short shorts, and he's punching another guy in the face, and husband and wife are sitting down watching this together. SubhanAllah, my thing. And see, nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with your wife looking at another man without a shirt on. Nothing wrong with that. Whereas his mother made dua, dua Allah, do not allow him to die until he looks into the faces of prostitutes. And the dua of the parent against the child is answered. Sometimes we might say to our children, your mother, the mother might say to the children in her anger, you know, you're going to be nobody just like your father. You're going to end up to be nothing just like your brother. You're going to end up being nothing just like your sister. You know, and this is, this might be a dua against your child. Say, may Allah never make you like this person. May Allah never make you like that person. Anytime you get angry or upset at your children, make dua for them as opposed to making dua against them. As the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Thalathu da'wat mustajabat la shakafihina." That there are three supplications that will always be responded to, and there is no doubt about it. The dua and musafir, the dua of the traveling person, and that is of course provided you're traveling for something that is halal. Because if you are traveling for something that is haram, you do not get that perk. You do not get that perk. The condition is that you are traveling for something that is halal. The dua al-mabloom, the dua of the oppressed person. The dua of the oppressed person is always answered even if he is a non-Muslim. As the Prophet sallallahu said, the ittaqo da'wat al-mabloom wa in kana kafira fa laysa bainahu wa bain Allah hijab. That fear the dua of the oppressed person even if he is a non-Muslim. Even if he is a non-Muslim. Because there is nothing that comes in between the dua of the oppressed person and the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing. You know, as Muslims, we should be weary. We should be, you know, um, cautious not to oppress non-Muslims. You know, because the dua of the oppressed person is always answered. And the last dua, the dua al-walid. Li walidihi wa fi riwayatin dua al-walid ala walidihi. The dua of the parent for the child. And in another narration, he said the dua of the parent against the child. 
It's always responded to. And so as the story continues very quickly, a uh, prostitute came to Juraj. Bani Israel began to talk about Juraj and his worship. And so a prostitute came, Imra'atun Baghiyya, Ja'at Faqala, and Shittum La Aftinanna Juraj. That if you would like me to, I would go and test Juraj. You know, they were talking about how religious he thinks he is. And the scholars, they explain that, you know, there's always someone waiting to prove to everybody that you are not who you say you are. Always. And sometimes it can be your own family members. It can be, you know, because people watch you and they think that, well, you think you're better than everybody. So there's always someone waiting to prove to everybody that you are not who you say you are. And will spare no opportunity you know, almost like Shaitan will spare no opportunity to expose <coughs> any fault or mistake that you have. So Ben Yisrael is talking about Juraj, how he thinks he's so religious, how he thinks he's this and that. So a prostitute comes and she says that if you guys will, if you desire, I'll go and I'll test Juraj for you. So they say, go ahead. So the woman, she came to Juraj, فَلَمْ يَلْتَفِدْ إِلَيْهَا Juraj never even looked at the woman. So when the woman realized she could not tempt Juraj, she went to the sheep herder who used to tend to his monastery. And she allowed him. So she allowed the, the sheep herder to um, uh, have intimacy, intercourse with her. And she got pregnant and she delivered the child. And when she went back to Bani Israel with the child, she said, Hada walid min Juraj. She said, this child belongs to Juraj. So they accepted that. Because when people don't like you, they don't need evidence. Delil. They never went back, because she's a prostitute. Why would you believe her? Juraj is a religious man. Why not go back to Juraj and ask him if that is actually his child? But this shows us that when a person doesn't like you, they don't need Delil. They'll take anything. If it's a lie, if it's fabricated, any accusation, they'll take it because they already been predisposed, right? They've been predisposed. They don't like you. So they'll take anything that comes to them, right? It's called a cognitive bias, biasness. You know, you, you, you already have in your mind that you dislike someone, so you'll look for any type of, you know, information that will be consistent with the way that you already feel. It's called a cognitive biasness, you know, and it's very dangerous because teachers in classrooms, to, which is why I took my children out of the public school, they do that. They already have in their mind that African American children are like this, they're unruly, they come from houses who the parents don't care about them, so they automatically treat the children like that when they come into the school. Not giving the children a fair chance, not looking at the children for who they are. They don't look at the children for who they are as children. They already have in their mind that this black child is like this and like this. And, you know, they may have their own biases or prejudices against black children anyway. All right? Especially in this type of environment. Racism is very prevalent here in this environment. Right? So, you know, this is dangerous. And Muslims, we can fall into the same thing as well. So it's very important that we, you know, correct our intention. And we always look at our hearts. We constantly make teftish, you know, we, 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 you know, revisit our hearts and we, you know, look into ourselves very deeply. So they went back to Juraj, they destroyed his monastery, and Juraj, he asked them, why are you doing this to me? They said, because you slept with the prostitute and you had a child with her. So Juraj, he said, where's the child? Ain't a sabi, itti bis sabi. He said, bring the child here, bring me the child. When they brought the child to Juraj, Juraj, he said, da'uni usalli. Lead me, let me pray to Raka'ah. You know, that was his way out of the situation, was to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he, after he finished praying, he walked over to the baby, and he poked the baby in the stomach, and he said to the baby, Man abuka, who is your father? And the child looked up at Juraj, and he said, Abi, arra'i al-fulan, my father is the sheep herder, such and such. The baby in the cradle, spoke in the cradle. And so Bani Israel began to apologize to Juraj, and they said to him, if you want, we will build your monastery up out of gold. And Juraj said, no, just return it the way that it was. Because sometimes when we feel like when people oppress us, we, that's our opportunity to take, it, take more than what we deserve. He said, no, I don't need a monastery of gold. Just return it back to the way that it was before you destroyed it. 
And I mean, there's so many lessons and so many benefits. I mean, we don't have a lot of time here, but there's just so many benefits and so many lessons in this story. And one of the biggest lessons is that this is a story from uh, a nation that passed. So this shows us that there was a tradition amongst the prophets of passing information from one generation to the next. Whether it was information related to um, the religion specifically or related to people in general. And you have today Muslims who don't take information from the Kufar. You know, I only read Islamic books. You know, you're, you're not going to perfect your human existence just by reading Islamic books, all right? No one said that all of the knowledge of the world is contained within the four walls of Islam. But the fact that the Prophet are giving us these narratives of you know, nations that came before us, it shows us that information is information and you can benefit from it if you find benefit in it. The Prophet said, That knowledge is the lost property of every believer. Wherever you find it, you have more right to it. I don't care what book it's in. If it's knowledge, if it's consistent with the religion, then alhamdulillah, we accept it. If it is inconsistent, incongruent with the religion, then we reject it. I don't care who said it, I don't care where it came from. You know, we, we get into this mode of, I don't take knowledge from non-Muslims, you know, from the Kufar, right? I, I, who said that all of the knowledge is in Islam? And I mean, you, you look at the Prophet Wasallam. they had poetry from Jahiliya that they benefited from, that they narrated, even in this Ummah, that were not, it wasn't information that came from Muslims. So, you know, we have to get out of this mindset of, you know, uh, this one track or one trajectory that, you know, we're only on this path and that's it. Knowledge is knowledge. Knowledge is knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa ala nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslim al-kathira wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.